Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll meet the man responsible for the operation of the famous West Coast steam locomotive, the 4449. We'll visit an American flyer layout in Pennsylvania and travel a Civil War section of railroads still in operation in Tennessee. First, it sounds as unlikely as a car that can fly or a boat that doubles as a motorhome, but we found a vehicle that rolls down the highway as well as the rails. Only trucks can deliver freight dock to dock and door to door, right? Well, not exactly. See this? It's a truck, isn't it? Well, not exactly. It's a unique hybrid called a road railer trailer. It's half trailer, it's half rail car. Where's the train, you're asking? Well, we'll show you. You see, the road railer is a trailer until it reaches the track. The tractor then drops off the trailer. On go the steel rail wheels and up go the rubber tires. And what's done is since our trailers move on bogies rather than flat cars, railroad wheels, our drivers back the trailer onto the, the gauge of the track. They, they use the air from the tractor, and, and special tractors are used within the confines of the yards to do this. The, the tractor uh, airs up the trailer, and the air suspension, which is useful in, in providing a smooth ride over the highway, allows the trailer to actually lift. The driver then backs the trailer onto the rail bogey and releases the air and, and the trailer settles onto the bogey. The next trailer is done ahead of that and backs, um, <clears throat> backs into a bogey. The truck pushes the trailer back and then the link and pin coupling, the, the uh, a tongue essentially on the, on the head of the road railer, backs into a pin on the, uh, the trailer in front of it and, and forms a slack free coupling. So it's done without a lot of the drama you see in conventional intermodal business. There's no cranes, there, there's not a lot of big physical movement around and there's certainly no cars, but it allows us to have a, a, a confined terminal uh, which operates at low costs and, and puts together slack-free trains. No longer does freight have to be transferred from a train to a truck. The road railer trailer just slides off the rail, hits the road, and the goods can be delivered door to door. The road railer technology has allowed us to carry goods that are very competitive with the trucking industry and tend to be the things that the railroads have lost their market share of a long time ago. Our, our primary commodity, although uh, much of it's handled by railroad, uh, our primary commodity is automotive parts. Amtrak makes extensive use of road railer trailers to deliver mail and other time-sensitive material. The road railer trailers are usually hooked onto the ends of high-speed passenger trains that roll a heck of a lot quicker than freight trains. And because they're on the end of the trains, the entire road railer trailer can be loaded on and off quickly. Amtrak's used road railer trailers since 1997, and we currently have a fleet of about 660 trailers uh, in three separate classes and four different types of trailers. Uh, we haul general high priority commodities. Uh, among them, but certainly not the complete list, is mail, periodicals, appliances, LTL shipments, canned food, some building materials, so forth and so on. Amtrak does haul uh, an increasing amount of express and the reason we haul it is uh, for a very basic reason, that being to make money. And the reason we need to make money is to uh, supplant passenger revenues in the interest of preserving long-distance intercity passenger service. It's probably uh, worthy of note that the last year that intercity, and I don't mean Amtrak intercity, I mean general intercity passenger service, uh, was on a break-even basis in the United States was 1959. And in 1959, 46% of the passenger train revenues were attributable to mail and express shipments. The road railer system is a patented technology produced by a company called Wabash National, which is headquartered in Lafayette, Indiana. It's the largest U.S. manufacturer of truck trailers. The concept of marrying the trucking and train businesses really isn't that new. Piggybacking on train flat cars has been around since the 1950s, so have versions of the road railer. In the 1980s, road railer trailers had the rail wheels permanently attached. But the road railers of today no longer carry their train wheels with them. The train wheels off, highway rubber on technology has made them much more lightweight, energy efficient, and competitive. Well, the road railer trailer uh, looks like an ordinary over the road trailer, but the resemblance is, uh, is a skin deep resemblance because the road railer trailer has got to do some things that an ordinary over-the-road trailer would not be structurally capable of handling. 
And uh, the, way, the best way to think about it is that if I've got a 125 unit road railer train traveling up a mountain, that's probably as much as 4,800 trailing tons or tons of road railer and lading uh, going up a 2% grade in the Rockies. I have 124 trailers hanging on the back of that front trailer. That front trailer has got to be extremely uh, strong. And an ordinary trailer, if we tried to do that, would be ripped in half. So what we're doing with the road railer trailer, much like an airplane, we're making every piece of that trailer work for us in a variety of ways as a system to give us the strength that we require. The trailer assembly starts off with our front and rear underframe. We, uh, we build the sides up. Uh, the sides are composed of a, in most cases, a composite material called Duraplate, which is a, a, a material that Wabash uses to build our van trailers. It's a sandwich of steel skins and plastic core. Uh, we rivet the sides of the trailer together from panels that are 48 inches wide by uh, roughly 112 inches tall, which is the height of the box of the trailer. We then flip the sides up and fasten them to the, uh, the floor structure of the trailer, the floor structure consisting of uh, cross members. Uh, in effect, you might think of them as beams across, uh, across the bottom of the trailer. They're made of steel. And then we have the aluminum floor laid on top of that, and they're, and they're fastened together. Then we flip the sides up. We put on the the nose and the doors of the trailer, and then uh, lay a thin aluminum roof across the top uh, uh, over roof bows, which again are like the equivalent of rafters that actually hold the, uh, the roof of the trailer up. Well, we have about, uh, about 8,000 road railer trailers in use today, and uh, we're running on just about every one of the major, uh, the major railroads. Uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, through its uh, Triple Crown services, is the largest user of road railer. Uh, but we also have road railers that are being operated by Amtrak behind their passenger trains carrying uh, high-speed uh, high mail and express. Uh, we have uh, road railers running for Swift Transportation, which is one of the major truckload motor carriers. It's very interesting. They're buying their own train between uh, Los Angeles and Portland. An exclusive Swift train uh, runs twice a week, uh, com composed of road railers. We have the Burlington Northern Santa Fe uh, running their ice cold express service, which utilizes refrigerated road railers, and they have just uh, recently extended their uh, run uh, over uh, CSX transportation to New York. And uh, the first train uh, that ran on that service here a, a couple of weeks ago uh, ran from Los Angeles to New York in 86 hours. So what what that translated into is that. Trailers that were loaded with fresh produce in California on Wednesday, that produce was on the store shelves in New York the following Monday. And that is a very, very high quality service and probably one of the fastest transcontinental freight trains in the country. The road railer system, a unique combination of truck and train, an efficient use of two separate types of transportation, 21st century freight shipping. Amtrak uses hundreds of road railer trailers from coast to coast. Right now, we're going to head out to Philadelphia to show you an impressive American flyer layout. It's impressive for a number of reasons. It's large, it's realistic, and you'll get a charge out of how these trains were converted so that they have more power now than the day they were new. What you see here is the culmination of a fantasy, the realization of a dream, a dream that was born back in the 1940s, when a young boy named Richard Robinson used to stare with wonder at the giant model train layouts in the big downtown Philadelphia department stores. Maybe one day he would have one. Maybe one day people would stare with wonder at his layout. That day is today. Well, I've always liked American Flyer because it was much more realistic than the competitive Lionel trains. It was scaled to prototype uh, dimensions, operated very smoothly, and operated on two-rail track, which uh, was certainly much more realistic, and combined the smoke and choo-choo that uh, Gilbert heavily advertised in the era. 
I started in 1948 when I was given my first train when I was 10 years old for a Christmas present, and I've collected trains ever since. So all the money I could save when I was a kid, I went to buy trains from collecting soda bottles off the beach and save that money to Christmas time and buy trains. And when I got out of the service in 1962, I was able to realize a lot of childhood fantasies because these trains were readily available at very minimal cost and it's easy, relatively easy to accumulate a very nice collection very quickly. So now Robinson has an American flyer layout with over 1,000 feet of S-gauge track. Construction began a quarter of a century ago and improvements are made continuously. The layout is 12 feet wide and more than 50 feet long. More than 40 switches keep things running smoothly. This layout is somewhat like a smorgasbord of modeling. Included is a loop of more than 125 feet of three-rail Lionel O-gauge track. Well, it started out as an S-gauge layout, but I realized that I always liked O-scale, and it was impractical to try to combine the two into one layout. You can't really operate two different scales with an integral layout, but by combining the O-scale loop on the outside edge of the trains, uh, uh, in effect, they don't interfere, and I don't run them at the same time, but I could enjoy running O-gauge trains as well. I've always liked flyer S-gauge, but in recent years, particularly the last 15 years, the growth of the product available in, in O-scale, both two-rail and three-rail, has been phenomenal. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to buy and operate and run these uh, wonderful O-scale models that are available today. The trains are American flyer. The track is not. It's bendable Gargraves track, which allows the modeler a great deal of flexibility. Started with Gargraves, stayed with it. It was at that time in the 1970s when I started this layout, it was really the only track available. Uh, it's flexible. It allows you to uh, design any radius as you want. This is stainless Gargraves track, so it's relatively impervious to moisture and has not had any corrosion problems or plating problems as some of the other track can do. It's flexible like other competing brands of, of flexible track, but it's just a matter of taking it and you can scribe lines on your layout to the curves that you want. It's just a matter of taking your hands and, and bending it. Now, did you notice how smoothly everything is running here? Part of the reason is simply good execution and good design. But part of the reason is because Robinson converted these American flyers from AC power to filtered DC power. It's not only smoother, it's quieter and it allows the train to operate with more power while generating less heat. It's actually something American Flyer itself experimented with a long time ago, but the power supplies back then simply couldn't supply the get up and go. In the 1960s, the technology became possible to do what Robinson wanted to do. It allows him to use toy trains on a scale layout. And it's something almost any modeler can do with a little time, a little know-how, and a few bucks worth of materials from the corner electronics store. Well, to convert any uh, Flyer Gilbert engine to run on DC power is really quite simple. This is a Hudson tender from the 1950 era, and by removing the tender shell and exposing the sequence reverse unit inside, we can leave that in place and just reroute the wires around it or take it out as you like, but if you want to leave it in place for originality's sake, this is a silicon diode rectifier available at Radio Shack for a few dollars. And by placing that directly behind the sequence reversing unit, it's only a matter of unsoldering the power lead wires from these and connecting them up. And you can leave in place the original wires on the sequence reverse unit if you pre put pigtail wires on this and just solder them on so that you can leave in place all the original wiring. It's just a matter of jumper leading over to the original ones. And once its power lead is disconnected, it's inactive anyway. So it just serves as a junction block for the wiring. That's all there is to it. You can put it back on. It takes five minutes to make the conversion. With the different types of trains and tracks, the hundreds of cast iron figures, and the realistic scenery, what you also see is potential. The potential of what you can do with classic American flyers and a little creativity. Richard Robinson says the older he gets, the more appreciative he is of one of the most wonderful aspects of the hobby, being able to share the joy of model trains with your grandchildren. On this program, you often hear us talk about the beauty of steam. Well, today we're going to talk with the man who's in charge of one that is often described as the most beautiful of all steam locomotives. The sound of a steam train running through the South is a part of American history. That history is alive and well and living outside of Chattanooga. 
The sound and the sight of steam in the south goes a long way back in history. It's something the folks here at the Tennessee Valley Railroad want you to think about and feel when you come here. We try to keep everything as, as authentic as possible. Um, the, the, uh, the crew members dressed appropriately and, and hopefully um, responding to the passengers the way that, that the passengers could have expected to be in, in the, around the turn of the century, for instance. We have rolling stock from what we call the golden age of railroading from 1910 to 1950 or so. And uh, we do have a mixture of coaches on our trains usually, the earlier types, the, the heavyweight, adjustable window style built in the 1915 to 1925 period. And then also the new, uh, we call them modern coaches built in the 1940s and 1950s. And those would be the lighter weight coaches um, with air conditioning and so forth. If you think about it, the sound of the whistle and the steam blasting into the sky is a kind of air conditioning. It gives this place the air of being locked in another time. One where gazing out at the south through train windows was something new, not nostalgia. Well, we are trying to preserve a little piece of history um, and, and running the, uh, the trains from that period, of course, is part of that. This is what people would have, uh, they would have experienced when they rode the train uh, back in the days when you didn't have automobile travel. Uh, people didn't have a car in their parking, in their garage or, you know, out in their driveway. They didn't just run out, jump in the car and take off. Um, they were more accustomed to a scheduled environment. Um, of course, they would usually ride their horse or their horse and carriage to the depot and then catch the, the train to another city for shopping or for visiting, for whatever purpose. But that was the lifestyle, and, and that's what we're trying to portray. It's a pretty ride through lovely country. And while right here the train isn't really going anywhere, the turntable is a favorite destination in itself. As always, the stars of the show are the steam engines. Just like people, each has its own story. Well, locomotive uh, number 610 is kind of unique. It's the last locomotive built by a major builder for domestic use here in the United States, built by the Baldwin Lima Hamilton Corporation uh, after the merger. It was built in 1952, actually two years after the uh, plant closed down. Uh, it was built for the U.S. Army Corps of Transportation. They use it for training purposes at their facility in Fort Eustace, Virginia. Uh, it was brought here to the Tennessee Valley Railroad in 1990 and restored back to operation. And we've been running it now for about 10 years. It's an excellent performer, with proper maintenance, of course. Proper maintenance is something they're proud of here, whether it's restoring an old loco or keeping up gems like this old tunnel that was hand dug before the Civil War. Attention to detail and authenticity of experience keep visitors climbing aboard year after year. The Southern Pacific 4449 is certainly one of the most famous steam locomotives ever constructed. It's earned every bit of that fame. It combines an unparalleled combination of steam power, beauty, and nostalgia. It was built by the Lima, Ohio Locomotive Works in the 1940s to pull the Southern Pacific's popular daylight passenger trains along the West Coast. It was the newest and most beautiful train the West had ever seen. And it was larger than life. An engine and tender nearly 100 feet long. Loaded with fuel and water, the locomotive alone weighed in at more than 840,000 pounds. The 4449 was in service for 15 years until the growing popularity of diesel forced her into retirement in the mid-1950s. Given to the city of Portland, she sat until the 1970s when train lovers had the brilliant idea of making this locomotive the one to pull America's bicentennial freedom train across the country. The man selected to get the retired train back into working order for the bicentennial run back in 1976 was Doyle McCormick, 
a man who has made railroading both his vocation and his avocation. He supervised the restoration and rebuild, and then rode with the Freedom Train every inch of the way. And that train was a 26-car train that toured the, the whole continental United States during the 1975-76 bicentennial celebration that took pieces of American history to the American people. And during its tour, uh, I can't exactly remember the numbers, there were like three or four million people that went through the train and there were 15 or 20 million people that saw the train. Uh, there were places, Chicago in particular, um, it was, to talk about it today people wouldn't believe, but there were so many people down at trackside to see that train go by that it was like a ship parting the ocean. And the slower you went, the longer they stood on the track. I mean, you're just piloting this thing through an ocean of people. There were thousands upon thousands of people. You wouldn't believe it today, but the reaction was that, you know, there's a lot of patriotism in America, and they all came down to see the Freedom Train. Afterwards, she was returned to Portland and restored to her original red, orange, and black paint scheme. Today, she carries the black and silver colors of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Doyle McCormick is in the cab during the occasional excursion. At most other times, a nostalgic McCormick pursues his other love. What you're looking at here is the remains of probably one of the classiest diesel locomotives ever built. This is an Alco PA, or like I say, the remains thereof. And my intention is to make this look as good as the day it come out of the factory eventually. Put my heart and soul into it, and most of my bank account too. The PAs hold a special place in my, my heart, if you want to call it that. Like I said, my dad worked for the nickel plate and got me hooked on trains at an early age. In 1955, he made a trip to New York City and took me with him, and we went down to the depot to get on the train, and he took me up and we rode the engine of nickel plate number eight from Connie out to Buffalo, which is 116 miles. The engine on that train was nickel plate PA number 190. That was the first diesel locomotive I ever rode. And from that point on, that became a special engine in my, you know, my passion. And I've always wanted to own, even as a, you know, a teenager with these wild fantasies, I wanted to own a PA. And it's been a quest I've been on since, you know, I was 14 years old. And it, it only took me 40 years to do it, is all. If you look at the lines of these and the architecture and the design, they just say speed. You know, the curves, you don't see curves in, in industrial equipment today. Everything's box, square corners. These have the nice lines, the curves, they're sleek. They got the long wheelbase trucks under them. They just look like something that wants to get out and run at 100 miles an hour. They have a face on them that only a mother could love, I guess, but uh, to a lot of the rail fans, these are the epitome of the diesel locomotive. Well, I can remember, you know, as, as a boy, my first ride was in a cab just like this. First diesel locomotive ever rode. Sat in the middle seat there most of the ways, and then the engineer, I was only, what, 12 years old, he brought me over and sat me in his lap, and let me blow the horn, of course. You know, that's pretty exciting for a 12-year-old. And then over the years, I rode uh, on the PAs on the nickel plate you know, dozens of times as I rode back and forth. I was in the Navy at Great Lakes, and my dad would take me on trips. Just formed a real connection with these engines, and when I stand here and I remember those days, I can see them coming back. I'll be 60-some years old when I do it again, but it'll be worth the trip. There are those of us who love the history of trains. It's people like Doyle McCormick we can thank for keeping that history alive. Now year to year, the 4449 has a very irregular running schedule, so it's best to call out to Portland if you're planning a trip to see it. Thanks for being with us and please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.